internet. My name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to show you how with about an hour on a lathe you can make this little device which lets you mount a DSLR camera to anything you want. Well, not the cat, but almost anything. You may not be aware that the entire Blondie Hacks media empire is uh, produced on a secondhand Android cell phone, but uh, I've been thinking about upgrading to DSLR, which is why this is on my mind. Now, DSLR gear is, of course, pretty expensive, but uh, my mom passed away a couple of years ago, and over the holidays, I was back home going through some of her stuff, and uh, what I didn't realize is that she had a secret stash of Nikon DSLR digital camera gear. Now, uh, this is actually uh, the D80, which does not shoot video. It only does photography. But the great thing about Nikon stuff is that going all the way back to 1959, all of the accessories and lenses are compatible. And my mom had a secret stash of all kinds of great lenses and other gear. So all I need to do is buy a more modern body that will shoot video. So uh, thanks mom, and uh, if you like this content, you should also thank my mom, because while I make this content, she made me. So by extension, she makes Blondie Hacks. And if your mom is still with us, do me a favor and call her. Now, this is my standard uh, setup here for shooting in my shop. Uh, this is a Noga arm. This is the large one. It has a very powerful magnet on the bottom that you can turn on and off with a simple switch. And I mount steel plates above my machine tools and in various locations around the shop. And uh, this, these guys are great because a simple twist to the knob and you can position it anywhere in space. Uh, and then I made this guy here. You've seen this in a previous video. This is my universal smartphone tripod mount. And uh, it allows me to quickly place different cell phones in there for different shots. Now this guy here is adapted with this little friction rotation mechanism, which allows me to position the cameras in space. And I did a blog post about making this guy, which I'll link to below, but it's not sturdy enough for a DSLR, so I wanna do something different. So these Noga arms have a standard M61 thread in them, so I'm gonna adapt that to the DSLR, uh, but you can use the same trick to mount the camera to anything you want, but not the cat. So here's what we're going to build, and uh, it looks very straightforward, and it is, but the details here are important. So uh, at the far end, we've got, uh, in my case, an M61 thread, but you can make that any thread you want to uh, attach it to whatever you like, but not the cat. Now the other end, though, is where things get tricky. Tripod mounts are deceptive in their simplicity. They're governed by ISO standard 1222-2010, and uh, it's a quarter 20 thread, but the length of that uh, thread is 4.5 millimeters, and uh, so that's about 177 thousandths, and they are serious about that length. Uh, there really is not room to go any longer than that because it's critical that the bolt not bottom out inside the body of the camera. Some cameras will actually damage them doing that. What's important is that the face of the thumb wheel here is what it seats against the bottom of the camera and locks the camera in place. So uh, that's tricky because with a quarter 20 thread, 177 thousandths, that only gives you two and a half or three threads at the most. And it's tricky to get a thread cut that short uh, while also leaving a clean inside shoulder there that's gonna seat tightly against the base of the camera. So I'm gonna show you a couple of tricks to do that, but let's get going here by uh, grabbing some material out of the junk pile. I'm using 12L14 steel. You could use mild steel, uh, whatever uh, floats your boat. So we'll stick this up in the vise and get ready to cut a few inches off of this guy and uh, all right we're gonna cut everything looks good and whoa that's why you always make sure that your vice base is tight so let's uh, try that again and Yahtzee all right, let's get this stock in the lathe. Now I'm gonna do this all in the four jaw, but you could definitely do this in a three jaw chuck, even though we're gonna be flipping the part end for end at one point, because uh, you know this is a camera mount, it's not a high speed spinning mechanism, so maintaining perfect concentricity absolutely is not very important. But I'm using the four jaw, so I'll square up my tool post here and get my 3D printed indicator mount in there. If you want uh, this 3D printed indicator mount, I'll put a link down to it in the description. That's uh, it's on Thingiverse. Uh, this is uh, my design based on an idea from Mr. Pete. So thanks, Mr. Pete. And now we're ready to make some chips. So I'm gonna start by facing this guy off. And then I'm gonna go ahead and punch a number two center in there because we're gonna need some tail support coming up. And I think it's 
time to take this chip brush out back and shoot it. I mean, send it to go live on a farm. And so now we can pull this part out of ways to do our turning. And I want to make sure that I pull it out such that I have room for the length of my part and room for the parting blade without hitting the chuck. So I just hold the parting blade in there just so I can get a sense of that. But before I put the tailstock in place there, I got to square up my tool post once again and put the indicator back in and dial in the part again because I moved it. Uh, so yeah, little things like this are why you might want to use a three jaw for a simple job like this. But uh, the truth is that uh, I like to take any opportunity I can to practice skills like this, uh, you know, to get faster and better at them so that that day when you really do need them, you uh, are well practiced and can do that work efficiently. So it never hurts to take a moment to practice machining skills, even if it's not strictly necessary. All right, let's make some chips. I'm going to start by turning the outer diameter to the largest on the part, which is one inch, and that's the thumb wheel. And uh, I do actually have drawings for this part. Uh, I made them even though it's such a simple part. So the uh, drawings and that 3D model that you saw earlier are available on my Patreon if you want. But uh, I can also just easily talk you through it here. So uh, as I said, I'm turning the outer diameter to uh, one inch, which, you know, in my experience feels like a good uh, tripod thumb wheel size. And with that outer diameter established, now I can come back in and get some layout fluid on there in the form of Sharpie marker and mark out all of my diameter changes. And uh, because I'm only going to be doing a couple of operations here, Sharpie marker is fine. If I was going to be handling this part a lot, I would, might prefer to use die cam, which is more robust. And I'm just using my calipers to mark the changes in dimension on either side of the thumb wheel, which of course angers many of my commenters. Here's a classic problem when turning small diameters. This tool here has an 85 degree angle on it, which is pretty standard for a turning tool. But this little space in here is only 60 degrees because of the angle of the live center. And we can't get very close to the work because of the mass of the live center hitting the tool post there. So one alternative is to use a 58 degree ground tool like this, which would allow me to get into that little space. But uh, the problem with this guy is that in order to get a nice clean shoulder, I'd have to run it at an angle like this. And then to keep clearance around the live center there, I'd have to push this tool way out in order to reach the stock. And then I've lost all my rigidity. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways around that. Uh, if you don't have the right tooling, I should say that there are uh, special tools that you can grind or buy as inserts uh, designed for this type of situation because it is pretty common. But uh, as I said, I'm going to show you another way. So I just turn down with the 85 degree tool because it happened to be on the machine until I get close. And then once I run out of space, I switched to this uh, 58 degree tool and I put it in straight instead of at the angle. And that let me get in close to the live center so I could get my diameter. But of course, it leaves me with that angled shoulder there. Now, the trick here is to leave this diameter a few thou large. And we're going to come back in later and finish it to final dimension. So this is the M6 side. So I'm going to be turning that to a few thou under uh, 6 millimeter in diameter because I'm going to be using a threading die and they need a little wiggle room. And I'm also going to chamfer the end here uh, to help the die get started. So now with the tailstock out, now I can come back in with my 85 degree tool and I can remove that angled section as a standard turning to a shoulder operation. So you can either turn it down or face it down as I'm doing here. And uh, once you get uh, that sort of hub area there close to the final diameter, now you can come back over and turn off the extra five thou that you left on that main shaft and turn it all the way down. And you've got one clean surface that's two diameter. So, this is just to show you that there's little tricks that you can do to get around if you don't have the exact right tool ground on hand for a particular job. And if you'd like to know more about turning to a shoulder, I have a video dedicated to that topic that shows you how to get a perfect diameter and a perfect depth and good surface finishes on both sides. I don't know what this chip is from, but it's delightful. Okay, time to make the M61 thread for the Noga arm, and my metric dies, unfortunately, are the hexagonal kind, so I have to use this special wrench that came with them, which means I can't use my tailstock die holder, which means I have to use the slightly less convenient method of squaring up the die by keeping pressure on it with the face of the quill on the tailstock, and this works okay. Okay. 
And before you write that comment that you're thinking about, it's a common misconception that hexagonal dies are all only mechanics dies for repairing threads. That's actually not true. There are hexagonal dies intended for cutting new threads as well. One nice feature of these hex dies, which unfortunately my round dies don't have, is that you can flip them around and they have uh, less taper on the other side, so you can get an extra half or full thread out of them, uh, which is really great when working up against a shoulder like this. And now we'll just chamfer the end of that for a little sousson of quality, and that also makes it easier to get a thread started if you have a nice friendly little chamfer on the end. Next I'm going to knurl the thumb wheels. I'm setting up my knurler here, and this is a scissor type knurler which has the wheels above and below the stock. Don't use those push or bump type knurlers that came with your lathe. They uh, put all of the pressure on one side of the work, and that's really bad for your spindle bearings, so don't use those guys. And uh, the secret to knurling is uh, slow pressure. I like to tighten it up and then let it uh, sit there for a little while, because you, unless you're using cut knurl wheels, uh, knurling is generally a forming operation, so it's uh, very high tool pressure, so you got to let it uh, sit for a minute and do its work. Lots and lots of cutting fluid, low RPM, and uh, just go until the uh, points look like they're uh, pretty much complete. A uh, common question people have about knurling is how does it work out on any diameter of work? And uh, actually the answer is it doesn't. If you want perfect knurls, uh, you do actually have to calculate the diameter of the stock to be a common denominator of the pitch of your knurl wheels. And there are online calculators to help you do that. But uh, the truth is, uh, it basically works on any diameter. It's just that the, uh, the the diamonds in the knurl just sort of get blurry, if you like, because subsequent passes, they're not perfectly aligned, and so the forming gets kind of mushy. So the result won't get you a job at Starrett, but it's certainly functional. And you always want to finish by chamfering the edge, because the knurling operation pushes a lot of junk over the edge of the part. ready to part this off, so I'm going to use this 1, 2, 3 block here to line up the outer edge of the parting blade with the front of the stock there. And then I'm going to put an indicator on the carriage and then use that to count off my distance. And then I can lock the carriage right there and I know I'm parting off in exactly the right place. Now if the finish on the back side of this part was critical, you might want to give yourself an extra five thousandths there uh, so that you can face the far side of the part because, you know, parting blades are kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes you get a good face with them and sometimes you don't. And Yahtzee. Now we're going to flip this guy around and we have to grab it by the threads. So uh, a piece of aluminum can on there will protect the threads from the jaws. And, uh, you know, don't clamp down crazy hard on them, but uh, this works very well. And we're just going to tap that in to make sure that it's seated firmly against the face of the jaws. And that way we'll have a square front face on there. And uh, we've got a skinny little area to indicate on that was uh, left over there after the parting between the knurling and the end of the part. And I'm going to use that with a sharp pointer and uh, dial in my part thusly. And as you can see, I've got a long way to go this time. On eBay, you can find these collections of indicator tips for all different shapes and sizes, and they are really, really worth the money. So get a set for your particular brand of indicator. And then after we're done, I just tap that guy in one more time, make sure we're good. Now I'm going to do a very light facing pass, and this is going to do two things. First, it's going to remove that little nubbin from the parting operation. But second, once this is done, we know exactly where the end of that tool is. We know it's exactly on the end of our part because the tool just made that surface. So now I can go down here on the carriage, put an indicator on here, and very precisely dial in where I need my shoulder to end up. And I can set the indicator on zero from here and then just turn my shoulder down to that zero. And that's important because as I said at the top of this show, the length of the thread on this end is really critical. We need to hit 180 thousandths and uh, we really don't have much wiggle room there. So now I can go in and turn this little shoulder down that's going to become the quarter 20 thread that goes into the body of the camera. With a feature this short, you need to deburr the end before checking your measurements, because if there's a burr on there, it's going to interfere since the anvils on the micrometer are touching the end of the part there. And as with any turning to a shoulder operation, my finishing pass consists of winding in, lock the carriage when I get to that face, and then wind out to face the shoulder. Okay, that came out really nice. So now I'm going to come in here and chamfer the end of that, which is uh, partly for appearance, but uh, it also helps get the die started. Now I'm going to set up my tailstock die holder for the quarter 20. So 
Gotta get the chips out of there. It's important so that the uh, die sits flat in the holder there so our threads are nice and straight. This is a shop made tailstock die holder, which uh, I'll probably do a video about at some point because people ask me about it a lot. But uh, you put the dies in there. This is for one inch dies, and it also has an adapter for 13 16 dies. And then there's a half inch shaft that goes in the tailstock chuck. And then that uh, guy just slides on there. And then the uh, holder can slide back and forth on that uh, shaft, and you can lock the tailstock then for maximum concentricity. And then it's got this sliding handle that goes in there, and with a little bit of pressure, we can get that guy started, and away it goes. Now you can see that because this thing is so short, we really only got two and a half or maybe three threads on there. So uh, there's not a lot of wiggle room. Now, if you have a very thin parting blade, uh, what you want to do then is go in and undercut the very base of this thread a little bit so that it will seat firmly against the camera. You can't have a, uh, an uncut section at the bottom of the thread like that. Now, uh, I don't have a thin enough parting blade to do that, and I don't want to lose any of the threads that I have with my wider blade, so I'm going to show you uh, another way around that here in a moment. But until then, I'm just going to kiss the end of it with the chamfer tool. I don't want to remove any threads, but I want to get the burr off of there, and this is our opportunity to put a nice chamfer on the other side of that knurl as well. And now we can pull this guy out of the chuck and you can see that a couple of layers of soda can did a very nice job of protecting those threads. They are completely undamaged. And our part is complete. We're ready to install it. Let's talk real quick about corrosion protection because I made this out of mild steel. Now you might choose to make it out of stainless or something, but uh, uh, eventually, especially the knurls, uh, are going to get rusty because they're going to collect moisture. So uh, you could try to paint it or something, but that's not going to work very well. Uh, oiling is going to get the camera all, all gross. So uh, I'm going to use this product here, which is Boshield T9. And what it is is a very thin spray-on wax product. And it's great for like tooling that's uh, somewhat infrequently used uh, or things that you don't want to oil, but you want to have that corrosion protection. So I have a link to this stuff down in the show notes, hashtag not sponsored, but I have uh, used it for quite a few tools. Uh, it is a little on the spendy side, but uh, it lasts a long time. This little can has lasted me like five years. So let's talk about that flush seating problem again. So here's ha what happens if we just thread it on as is. You can see that the uh, base of the thumb screw doesn't quite sit flush on the base of the camera. And that's important because that flush surface is what's holding the camera in place. That's what locks it in. In this case, the thread isn't bottoming out inside the camera. It's that little bit of a shoulder where we couldn't get the threads all the way down that's causing the issues. But okay, we can just put a jam nut on here now, which keeps it from coming loose from the Noga arm. So if you don't have a thin enough blade to undercut the thread, another way to do it is just to put a little star washer on there, and that takes up the space of that shoulder where there's no thread, and also helps lock the camera in place so that its own weight doesn't cause it to unthread. Now if you're worried about the star washer marking up the bottom of the camera, you can also use a rubber pad, something like what a lot of tripods use, but in my shop the cameras are tools, they're not museum pieces, and they gotta earn their keep, so I don't mind scratching up the plastic a little bit. Now one weakness in this design that you may have noticed is that because there's no free spinning element uh, in the system here, it's a little bit fiddly to get the camera on and off. You actually have to kind of wind the camera body itself around. So uh, we're going to look at a more sophisticated version of this device in the next video that uh, is going to address those concerns. That does it for this little project. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I hope you'll make one yourself. Drawings and models are in my Patreon. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.